Um, his, research, his research focuses on the, how sensory motor signals contribute to metacognition. And today he's going to tell us about how single, about single unit recordings in humans uh, and what they revealed uh, about the relationship between perceptual consciousness and metacognition. So Nathan, if you're ready, take care. I am ready. Uh, thank you, Nadine. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. And thank you also, Nadine and Steve, for this uh, kind invitation. I'm pretty happy to be to take part in this uh, Distinguished Club. I was uh, then telling Steve just uh, before we started that I, I felt a bit rusty. I haven't given talks in, in a while with the, the current situation. So I hope this will uh, uh, go well. My, my goal today is to um, present you some recent uh, results we, we obtained uh, indeed uh, about uh, single unit recordings in, uh, in humans, but not only. And uh, I'd like to propose um, a shared uh, mechanism for perceptual consciousness and perceptual monitoring, which involves um, evidence accumulation. Um, so to start off, I'd like to uh, give some uh, pretty uh, basic definitions of what we're talking about. So uh, not, not to make a consensus, but just to make sure that we are uh, on the same page when uh, interpreting results. Um, and I will start by defining um, perceptual consciousness simply by saying that we consider uh, this as what it is like to uh, see, feel, hear, smell, uh, or touch. Uh, so the subjective experience, the phenomenal experience, for instance, associated with uh, this person here looking outside uh, to a man walking his dog. So one can imagine that there is indeed something it feels like to uh, see a dog. Okay, so that's for perceptual consciousness. And today I will also be uh, speaking about uh, perceptual monitoring, which uh, this time I define about our capacity to think about our own uh, thinking. So our capacity to introspect and, for instance, to uh, judge the quality of any given uh, perceptual representation we may have formed. Um, and all the work uh, I'll be presenting uh, should be uh, situated within the, the quest for the neural correlates of consciousness that was started by Crick and Koch and, and others some decades ago. Um, and here's the, the main uh, situation. So. Uh, we're still considering this man uh, looking outside uh, to this uh, guy walking his dog. And uh, the game here in this quest is to identify in, the, in this observer's brain a set of uh, neurons that we call uh, the neural correlates of consciousness or NCCs, which are minimally sufficient for a subjective experience to occur. For instance, here, the subjective experience of a dog. Okay. And so the game is to separate these neurons from all uh, other neurons that do a bunch of stuff, but that is not directly related to uh, subjective experience. And we typically do so um, using a, a contrastive approach that was uh, proposed by, by Bernard Bars in the 90s, uh, where we compare brain activity and behavior um, in case uh, a stimulus evokes a subjective uh, experience, so the, the, the percept of the dog. Uh, to the same stimulus when uh, it doesn't evoke any subjective experience at all. And so by contrasting brain activity uh, with and without subjective experience, one can isolate, uh, given some typical confound and ruled out, uh, the neural correlates of perceptual consciousness. Um, now today, I, I would like to extend this approach to uh, another level, which is uh, this time trying to document some neurons that are involved not in uh, the subjective experience of the dog, but of our capacity to uh, introspect and monitor uh, how faithfully we represent that, that dog. I don't know if, you, if this is on your way or not. It's my face instead of the dog. Um, okay, so the way we do this, the way we uh, study um, uh, perceptual monitoring uh, in the brain is uh, typically through uh, confidence ratings. So we ask a subject to um, uh, report the percept and then indicate how confident he or she is about uh, his or her response. Uh, and so we, we speak of the calibration of confidence that is the capacity to adapt uh, confidence to one's own performance. And uh, there's, uh, I won't tell you uh, much new uh, here today, Steve and, and his colleagues have done a, a myriad of, uh, of uh, brilliant studies in, in the last decade uh, uh, studying this. 
Okay. Um, that's for the neural correlates of consciousness. Now, um, as I said in, in, in the first slide, uh, today I want to bring uh, a mechanism to this uh, NCC, which is evidence accumulation. So that's a, a very broad uh, concept that is used in many uh, domains, including neuroscience. And typically we, we define this as a process by which noisy sensory information is sequentially sampled until sufficient evidence has accrued to favor one decision over others. So that's a, again, a very, a very broad concept that has been uh, recently discussed uh, in the concept of uh, consciousness. And for instance, uh, Stan Dehan, uh, among others, has proposed uh, within the global workspace theory of consciousness that evidence accumulation following the, the processing of a stimulus increases up to a level which may serve as a trigger for what he calls uh, ignition. So this, this uh, widespread activity throughout the brain that is associated with uh, conscious access. Okay, so evidence accumulation would be like a, a step, a necessary step before ignition takes place and therefore uh, before uh, conscious access uh, occurs. That is at the theoretical level. Uh, now, if we look at things uh, more pra practically, how it's done empirically, um, we typically use these kind of models where we assume that, uh, so there's a, a stimulus presented to a subject and we model um, evidence in the brain as uh, following a, like a noisy uh, trajectory, uh, but accumulating over time, here the horizontal axis is time, until it reaches uh, a threshold. And depending on the rate with which this evidence accumulates uh, uh, over time, with a concept we call, or a parameter we call the drift rate, uh, some, uh, sometimes uh, this drift is, is a bit lower, so evidence accumulates uh, slowly and meaning that the decision bound is crossed uh, at a later time. So with this, we can account for decisions being taken at different moments in time. And sometimes we can assume that uh, evidence is not sufficient uh, and uh, the decision bound is not crossed at all, which would result in no decision. I should say that these models have been used more predominantly for discrimination tasks and there's not much work studying this in detection tasks which are most relevant for consciousness. The goal here of these models, uh, important to remind us, is that we want to fit distributions of reaction time. So we want to find a set of parameters that generate those trajectories which uh, in turn uh, result in a let's say a gamma distribution of reaction times that we would observe. And, uh, and a big problem here is that of course, in case there is no response, uh, there's no reaction time to model. So maybe that's a, a reason why there's a, a bit of a missing link here between um, what's done empirically and, and the claims at the theoretical level that assume that evidence accumulation uh, precedes conscious access. So how do we uh, measure evidence accumulation uh, in the brain? Um, there are several signatures uh, that have been uh, described, mostly from uh, non-human uh, primates. And today I will, uh, I will um, speak about two main uh, signatures of evidence accumulation. One is that accumulation should be indexed by a, a neural process that varies according to uh, the response time and another signature is that this accumulation process should be indexed by a process that varies according to stimulus intensity. So here I'm showing you um, an example of such six signature that was described by uh, Connell and uh, Simon Kelly and others uh, with uh, EEG. So uh, subjects were asked to detect a, a, a target um, while we measured uh, EEG. And um, what you can see, if you look at electrodes, uh, parietal electrodes, uh, as you can see here, the, the topography, uh, is that you can find um, uh, an EEG component, uh, which is called the CPP, the central posterior positivity, um, with an amplitude pattern that increases as a function of um, uh, response time. So you can see that the EEG amplitude increases simultaneously for, uh, in all cases, but it reaches a peak uh, uh, that occurs more quickly for fast responses, a bit later for medium responses, and even uh, later for slow responses. So 
So when we observe such pattern, we can uh, assume that evidence accumulation is involved uh, um, in, in the process. And same thing occurs for uh, a stimulus intensity. If you measure the same uh, CPP, so as you can see, the topography is very similar. You can find that uh, the amplitude uh, starts rising at the same moment, but uh, reaches a peak earlier for strong stimuli than uh, for weak stimuli. So these are two indirect, indirect ways to uh, prove that there is evidence accumulation uh, occurring. And it's, uh, uh, it's pretty important to, to remember because I will be using those two signatures uh, later uh, in the talk. Um, so evidence accumulation has been used not only to account for uh, first order decisions, uh, but also for uh, confidence uh, ratings and therefore for to study perceptual monitoring. There are two main types of uh, models that have been proposed. Uh, a first one uh, here, I'm, I'm showing you a, a classic uh, model by Pleskak and, and Bruce Meyer, um, which proposed a way to model uh, confidence with these uh, um, diffusion processes by allowing a second uh, stage diffusion. So after the decision uh, bound is crossed, um, these uh, two authors assume that uh, diffusion could uh, still continue and uh, they use the second diffusion uh, stage to model uh, confidence uh, in one's decision. Um, you can also model confidence with a, a, another uh, family of, uh, of accumulators. Uh, this time you can, uh, for instance, a paper by Vandenberg in New Life in 2016, assuming that uh, you're presented with a, a stimulus that can move rightward or leftward, you can model confidence by uh, assuming that there exists two attractors, two accumulators, sorry, one corresponding to the evidence in favor of a right motion, another accumulator um, uh, for the left motion, and you can define confidence by letting these two accumulators uh, diffuse and take the, ra the ratio of uh, these two accumulators as a proxy for confidence. Uh, using this family of model is a bit tricky in case of a detection task because it's pretty hard to imagine that uh, you would accumulate evidence uh, in favor of, a, of an absence of a stimulus. So later on, I will mostly uh, be speaking about this uh, family of, uh, of uh, evidence accumulation models or confidence. All right. So our goals today are multiple. So first, I'd like to uh, propose a measure of evidence accumulation in a contrastive study of consciousness, comparing situations where a stimulus evokes a conscious experience versus when it does not, um, considering at the same time detection responses and confidence reports, while rolling out some typical confounds that have hindered the, 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 definition, the, the, yeah, the definition of NCCs, and typically, uh, I'd be speaking about multiple compounds or compounds in, in terms of task demand. And finally, uh, I will show you some uh, neuronal implementation of uh, this uh, mechanism. This work has been uh, submitted recently on the uh, on, uh, bioarchive. Uh, this was led by uh, Michael Pereira, who you can see here. And uh, I should uh, take a second to publicly uh, Thank him and acknowledge the, the tremendous work uh, he's done in this uh, in this article. It's, it's mostly his stuff that I'm, I'm presenting here um, today. And I should also say that I have a pretty uh, spotty connection uh, uh, these days. So in case uh, I suddenly disappear in the void, I, I uh, asked Michael, who kindly accepted to take over for the, for a few minutes. So he's really the the man of the situation in, uh, today. Um, okay, so I will uh, present you today three different data sets, uh, starting with a, a data set from uh, an epilepsy patient uh, we were lucky to collaborate with. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty rare patient for two main reasons. The first reason is that he was implanted with a micro electrode array. Uh, so that's this little chip that you can see here that is uh, smaller than my fingernail. Uh, these are rare and uh, even more so because it was implanted this time on a, on a region that is uh, quite uh, uh, rarely implanted normally, uh, which is the parietal posterior cortex. Um, next, I will present to you uh, a data set with healthy volunteers uh, involving this time EEG and computational modeling. And finally, another 
uh, population of patients uh, which undergo a surgery for deep brain stimulation. All right, so I'll start with the epilepsy patient. Uh, that's a project we conducted in, uh, in Geneva uh, in collaboration with the VIS Center. Um, and again, we, we had the chance to, to work with this uh, young patient who was 23 years old. He was uh, cognitively uh, intact and he had uh, intractable epilepsy. For, so uh, to document the, the origin of his uh, seizures, he, was, he received a, a grid of uh, uh, electrocorticography uh, electrodes that you can see here on the left uh, parietal cortex covering uh, three central regions and up to like here posterior parietal cortex. And as part of a, of a research program, he also received this uh, microelectrode array. So this little chip who, which possesses uh, 100 channels that can measure single uh, neurons. Okay. And as you can see, the microelectrode array was uh, located right uh, on, the, on the bank of the postcentral sulcus uh, in a region that I will call uh, the posterior parietal cortex, which is known to be a hotspot for evidence accumulation. So when we knew this uh, patient was programmed, we we're uh, pretty excited and, and, and this, uh, this guy was very uh, keen in participating in our experiments. So we uh, did three experiments with him. Uh, one in which he had to report immediately what uh, a stimulus that he detected. Another one where we imposed a delay between the stimulus and his uh, responses. And finally, a third experiment where we had nothing to do. And no report uh, experiment. So this is our um, paradigm. Uh, because we had electrodes in uh, sensory motor uh, regions, we opted for uh, tactile stimuli instead of the classic visual uh, stimuli that we're more familiar with. So we equipped uh, our patient with um, a little uh, vibrator here on the right uh, wrist. And we could control uh, this vibrator uh, with a sound card and uh, stand vibrotactile stimuli um, with a very, uh, uh, fine-tuned intensity and, uh, and uh, duration. So we made sure to send a stimulus uh, with an intensity that would correspond to uh, about a hit rate of about 50%. So half the stimuli were detected and the other half were uh, not detected. Uh, we used for that a staircase procedure. And the task of the subject was simply to uh, press a key um, as soon as he felt uh, something. Um, so if a key press occurred within a two seconds window uh, following stimulus onset, we define this as a hit in blue. And uh, if uh, a key press uh, did not occur within these two seconds, we uh, consider this as a miss. And in case the patient uh, pressed a key uh, outside the stimulation window, we uh, consider this as a false alarm, which happened only once or twice in this, um, in this experiment. Um, I should say that we made sure that stimulus intensity or stimulus onset did not vary uh, between um, hits and misses uh, to make sure that at least at the, in terms of uh, stimulus feature, there was no obvious uh, difference that could explain our, our results. Here I show you the distribution of response times uh, that we obtained from this patient. And as you can see, when, when the patient felt a stimulus, he pressed uh, less than one second on average after uh, stimulus onset, uh, which means that we uh, do not mix up hits and, and misses here. There's a clear, quite a clear uh, separation between the two uh, stimulus categories. So uh, next I will show you uh, the data from uh, this uh, micro electrode array. Um, so we end up with a, a time series from this microelectrode array that we submit to a, a spike sorting algorithm that allows us to uh, detect uh, individual neurons. And um, in this experiment, we could isolate 186 uh, neurons, among which 81 had uh, different firing rates between hits and misses. And we made sure with permutation tests that uh, we could not observe this just uh, uh, by chance. And most of these uh, neurons had a higher firing rate for hits than for misses, although we found a few um, neurons that also encoded specifically uh, misses. 
So among these 81 neurons, 14 of them uh, showed a, a correlation between a spike rate and a response time, which is uh, pretty interesting because it's a signature of evidence accumulation, as I, as I said earlier. And I will show you now uh, two neurons among these 14. So that's uh, one example and another example here on the right column. The top row uh, describes the, the waveform, so the average uh, spike of each of these uh, neurons. Below, you have a raster plot where, so you have uh, a time on the horizontal axis, zero is the stimulus onset. And here on the y-axis, the y you have um, trials that are reordered as a function of the response time. So in case of a slow response, medium response, fast response, or no response at all in, in red in case of a miss. And each little dot is a spike that we measured. So now if you aggregate those responses on the, on the y-axis, you obtain uh, the plot at the bottom, which represents the, the firing rate okay, over time. So as you can see, after stimulus onset, you have an increase of firing rate that uh, is uh, uh, stronger for hits than for misses, but that also occurs earlier for fast hits versus medium hits versus slow hits. And again, that's uh, considered as a signature for evidence accumulation. We also analyzed uh, the EPOG uh, grid uh, and we looked for uh, this time uh, uh, electrodes that had local field potentials uh, whose amplitude differed between hits and misses. As you can see here, the column map indicates how much uh, this uh, electrode uh, distinguished hits from misses. You can see a widespread uh, effect, both in, in premotor regions, uh, but also in uh, more posterior regions. And uh, the amplitude of these LFPs also showed this uh, hallmark of evidence accumulation with a, a steeper and earlier increase of uh, local field potentials for fast responses versus slow responses. Okay, so that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of evidence accumulation, we have uh, evidence uh, at the single neuron level in humans, which is uh, to the best of our knowledge at first. But to study consciousness, it's not so interesting because there's an obvious confound here, which is that um, uh, when the subject uh, uh, felt something, he pressed a key, whereas in case of a miss, there was no key press. So we could, it's possible that we're documenting NCC, but it's also very possible that we are uh, documenting a motor confound between hits and misses. That's why we turned to uh, experiment two, which uh, was pretty similar to experiment one, uh, but had a few uh, additions. So first of all, we added a, a temporal delay between the simulation window and the, and the response so that anything we measured in the brain around stimulus onset could not be contaminated by the act of, uh, of responding. Um, we also added 20% of trials uh, with no stimulus at all, which allowed us to measure uh, correct rejections. And this time the response was uh, provided uh, verbally instead of a uh, motor um, key press uh, to make sure that our effects would generalize to other uh, response effectors. And uh, last but not least, we added a, a confidence rating. So after each trial, the subject had to tell us whether he was uh, sure or unsure about his detection response. Uh, here is the behavioral result from this, uh, from this patient. So uh, we have miss, hits, and correct rejections. Again, we made sure that uh, stimulus intensity, stimulus onset was equivalent in all uh, categories. Um, here you have the distribution of confidence for uh, hits and misses. And you can see that overall uh, misses were associated with a lower confidence than uh, hits. Because we had a few trials in this uh, clinical setting, we just uh, combined together uh, ratings one and two as low confidence and rating of three as high confidence. Now, in terms of um, neural uh, data, uh, this time we uh, identified, identified sorry, 86 uh, neurons, uh, which we analyzed with a, a factorial uh, strategy. So we tried to explain the spike rate of these neurons as a function of both uh, detection and confidence. 
um, we found um, no main effect of detection. So only one neuron had a firing rate that varied only as a function of detection. And those permutation analysis we, we did uh, reveal that could have observed this by chance. Uh, same thing for confidence, but we found 17 neurons uh, with an interaction between detection and confidence and this uh, could not have been uh, observed by chance. Here again are two examples of such uh, neurons. So waveform, uh, raster plot, and I will focus here on the, on the average uh, firing rate. And what you can see here is that um, there is a specific increase in the, this uh, dark blue curve, which corresponds to high confidence hits, whereas uh, low confidence hits and misses were virtually indistinguishable uh, at the single uh, neuron level. Okay, so that means that taking one neuron at a time, we couldn't make the difference between a miss and a low confidence um, hit. Now, that doesn't mean that at the population level, uh, nothing happens. And it could well be that uh, uh, single neurons do not encode this difference, but um, at the, as a population, uh, this, this occurs. So to, to address this, uh, what we did is we uh, considered all neurons together and fed them to a, a decoder, which was a simple uh, weighted uh, average of the, of the neuronal uh, input. And with this decoder, we built uh, um, an algorithm that uh, was able to distinguish hits from misses. Okay, so it's obvious that we managed to do that because taking individual neurons, we, we could do this. Uh, but what was interesting is that taking the output of this decoder, uh, we could find that it co the, the decoder output correlated with confidence for hits that you uh, that is described here. That means that there is uh, information, uh, information relevant uh, to confidence in a decoder uh, trained on uh, detection, suggesting that there may be an overlap between uh, the representation of detection and confidence in these neurons, but taken as a, as a population. I should also say that uh, these experiments, uh, experiment one and two, were uh, run on different days. Uh, so we're pretty much running between the hospital and the lab and, and designing experiments on, on the go. And unfortunately, we cannot make um, uh, comparisons between the neurons we found here and the neurons uh, from experiment one, because the, there's no way we can make sure that they are, that they are similar. Some die, some uh, we do not record anymore, some new appear. So it's, it's difficult to make a link between uh, those two sets of neurons. Uh, we also analyzed the ECOG uh, grid. Uh, same thing, looking for an interaction between detection and confidence, this time in the amplitude of local field potentials. And, uh, again, the, if you look at the color map here of each uh, electrode, you can see that the significant electrodes this time uh, are all, well, it's only two of them, they are situated in the posterior parietal cortex. And the effects we found in experiment one in uh, anterior regions, in motor regions, uh, disappeared, meaning that probably there was indeed some motor confounding uh, in experiment one. And so in these two electrodes here that really are uh, near to the microelectrode array that is represented in green, we found the same pattern of results with uh, the amplitude of uh, LFPs uh, showing a significant increase for high confidence hits, but no big difference between misses and, and low confidence hits. Okay, uh, that's uh, pretty nice. Um, we ruled out uh, obvious compounds in terms of uh, um, motor button presses, but there are another. Uh, there is another uh, possible compound, which is uh, task demand. So, as you may know, there is an ongoing debate right now, um, um, uh, and we wonder if to uh, study consciousness per se, uh, we should not be doing it without. Uh, asking the subject to do a task at all. So in that case, uh, the subject, after feeding a stimulus, he had to uh, maintain the representation in his working memory, then prepare a verbal response, then prepare a confidence response. So we don't really know whether what we measure here is simply um, uh, related to subjective experience of feeling something vibrating on your wrist, or is it due, uh, or is it related to the task that is associated uh, with the stimulus? So are we measuring a neural correlate uh, of uh, task or a neural correlate of consciousness? 
So we went back to the hospital again, uh, but this time we, uh, we, let, uh, we gave a break to our poor uh, uh, patient and we simply uh, equipped him with a vibrator and let him mind wander while we uh, sent him either low vibration, medium vibration, or strong vibrations. Okay. Uh, so he had nothing to do, just uh, uh, experience the, the vibration when, uh, when possible. And we checked if uh, we still measured uh, uh, neural activity that would encode uh, the stimulus in the absence of a task. That's what I show you here. So we identified 96 uh, neurons. And among these 96, 14 of them uh, show the main effect of intensity, meaning that the, the mean firing rate increased more so for strong stimuli than for medium or weak stimuli, which if you remember the, the, the introduction is another signature for evidence accumulation this time that we observe without um, um, a task. And this pattern is very similar to the, the pattern of result I just showed you uh, from experiment two. Meaning that this correlate uh, uh, that we found does not disappear and is not only attributed to the, the task at play. Okay, so time for some interim conclusions. Uh, we described some PPC neurons with a spike rate uh, that is proportional to response time and intensity, which are uh, two outmarks of evidence accumulation in humans. We found uh, neural correlates of detection and confidence in the posterior parietal cortex, which are independent of response effector and task demand. So after we tested this uh, patient again, went back to the lab and we were pretty excited by the, by the results and the findings, but at the same time, we we're a bit worried uh, about the, the generality of these findings and how we would uh, uh, publish them, given that uh, it was only one single uh, patient. We looked at a very, very uh, specific uh, a patch of tissue in the parietal cortex, a very small, so we measured uh, a, a hundred neurons among uh, the billions available with a very limited number of trials in a clinical setting, you know, with a nurse that can uh, come in and come out at any moment. So it was, it's a beautiful set of results, but we were a bit worried that uh, in fact, we might have been missing the, the forest for the trees. So how can we uh, generalize our findings to a to a broader sample. So we uh, came back to good old uh, EEG and good old healthy uh, volunteers, psychology students who come to the lab and, and perform uh, the same experiment with much more trials. Uh, this is the experiment we uh, conducted next. So an EEG experiment on healthy volunteers, 18 of them, very similar to the experiment done by the, by the patient except this time we had uh, 500 uh, trials per subject, which allowed us to uh, not only um, uh, describe the behavior better, but also use this time visual analog uh, confidence scale, um, which allowed us for more refined uh, analyses. So here I show you a summary of the behavioral results. Uh, on the x-axis, you have number of trials uh, for hits, misses, correct rejections, and false alarms. As you can see, there's uh, about uh, the same number of trials for hits and misses, about 20% of, of uh, correct rejections and very few, uh, again, false alarms, which we could not uh, analyze here. And uh, as before, we made sure that the uh, stimulus intensity and stimulus onset did not vary between uh, hits and misses. We obtained those uh, nice distributions for uh, confidence ratings in each category. And um, just to, to be brief about it, so uh, what we found is that when a subject responded uh, yes, so in case of a hit or a false alarm, we observed higher confidence uh, for a correct response or for a hit. And same thing occurred when the subject said uh, no, so um, in case of a miss or correct rejection, but again, confidence was higher uh, for a correct rejection, meaning that there was some uh, metacognitive monitoring uh, uh, happening here, uh, even though it was weaker for for no uh, responses, which has been described uh, previously by uh, Matt and Mazor and, and Steve and, and, and others. Um, okay, now I will uh, turn to the EEG results. So same thing, we followed the same approach as for the uh, single unit patient. 
uh, we analyze the EEG amplitude with a, with a factorial analysis, uh, looking for an interaction between detection and confidence, which we found here in a cluster of electrodes uh, on the uh, co corresponding to the to posterior parietal uh, scalp regions. And if you uh, take this cluster and you plot the amplitude over time, you obtain this uh, ERP, where you see again, pretty similar to the, the results before, that there is an increase of amplitude for high confidence hits that is much bigger than for low confidence hits and bigger than for misses. Um, and again, we tried to uh, see if there was some overlapping representation between detection and confidence uh, in the EEG signal. So following the same approach, we took all uh, EEG channels, fed them uh, to a, a decoder that took the a weighted average of these uh, EEG amplitudes and allowed us to decode uh, hits from misses. That's what I am uh, presenting you here. So this is the decoding performance over time from stimulus onset. Uh, and you can see that after 200 milliseconds or so, uh, the decoder is able to uh, distinguish hits from misses. And now um, if we take the decoder outputs and correlate it with uh, confidence ratings, we found uh, a region that is outlined here uh, with a significant correlation, meaning that during this period of time, uh, there is some uh, overlapping EEG representation of both detection and confidence, suggesting that they might share uh, a neural representation. Okay, uh, since we had a ton of trials, we could uh, attempt to fit, to fit uh, computational models. Uh, and I will uh, go back here to um, um, the good old drift diffusion model. Um, one obvious problem here that we have is that uh, we have no uh, meaningful response time to fit. Uh, because we impose the delay between the stimulus and uh, the response, any response time we measure is not, is not very interesting. It can, we, we don't have a good proxy for the moment at which uh, the subject took his decision instead. Um, so to fit uh, such model, uh, Michael had a, had a great idea was to, instead of fitting uh, a gamma distribution of reaction times, he proposed to fit uh, the shape of the uh, EEG response, which is what I will uh, show you now. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's relevant because the, the shape of the EEG response does not vary even if we impose a delay between the stimulus and the response. So that's our model. Uh, it's a classic uh, drift diffusion models with uh, some parameters that some of you may recognize um, and, and, and an additional parameter, which is, uh, which is quite uh, important. So we consider a decision variable uh, that uh, oscillates. Uh, uh, it's a stochastic process, so there is noise in the, in the signal. It oscillates, but from the moment the stimulus uh, is uh, presented, uh, there is a, a boost in drift rate, and therefore the decision variable increases up to uh, crossing a decision bound. Um, and if this thing happens, we consider that the stimulus was detected and it's a hit. Okay. So we fitted a, a drift rate for each subject, a decision bound for each subject, so that we can account for some people uh, that are more conservative than others. And we also fitted a, an important parameter, which is a leakage uh, parameter, which drives the decision variable back to zero uh, constantly. Uh, we did this for two things. First of all, this allowed us to um, uh, prevent uh, noise to be accumulated in the absence of a stimulus. So if you have no leakage, you would accumulate noise and reach the decision bound all the time and uh, resulting in false alarms that we, we don't observe uh, in the data. And also this leakage uh, factor allows us to drive back this uh, decision variable uh, towards zero after it reaches the threshold, which is necessary if you want to mimic uh, a typical EEG response, as I showed you uh, earlier. Um, in case of a miss, uh, the same thing occurred, except that the uh, drift rate was not sufficient uh, so that the decision bound is not crossed, and therefore we define this trial as a miss. And in case of a correct projection, there is no stimulus uh, presented at all. So due to leakage, you don't accumulate noise and uh, the subject responds, no, there was no uh, stimulus uh, presented. 
So we fitted all these parameters and some others that I, I don't show you now uh, to the behavioral data and to the EEG data uh, for it to distinguish hits from misses from correct rejections. But we also uh, fitted it to confidence data. Uh, for that, we tested different uh, means of defining confidence. Uh, and for the sake of time, I will just present you uh, the rule that, uh, that worked uh, best. Um, it's a, quite a simple rule. It just defines confidence as the distance between uh, the decision bound and the maximum of evidence accumulated within the trial. So for this uh, trial, for this hit, that would be this distance. And for this miss, that would be uh, this distance here. So this simple uh, rule is, is pretty nice because it can account, for instance, uh, for uh, misses in which you have a high confidence. So for instance, if you don't accumulate much evidence at all, the distance between the bound and the max of the it's low maximum of evidence accumulated is, uh, is big. So that would uh, result in a, in a high confidence miss. And for instance, uh, if you ac keep accumulating evidence uh, after the decision is bound, is, is cross, sorry, uh, you would uh, end up with a high confidence hit. Um, now we'll uh, uh, present you some of the model fits. Um, the data is represented by circles and the model fits by uh, crosses. As you can see, we could reproduce fairly well uh, the hit rate and false alarm rate we observed uh, with our EEG uh, 18 patients, 18 subjects, sorry. We could also reproduce uh, the mean uh, confidence for hits, misses, and correct rejections, and also the distribution of these uh, confidence ratings. And finally, we could uh, reproduce the shape of the EEG responses corresponding to hits and misses. So we are pretty excited by this novel uh, fitting procedure. Um, we think that this leakage factor uh, is, is inter interesting because it allows fitting EEG data uh, even in the absence of behavioral response or, where, or when the timing of these responses is irrelevant as occurs in our case. So it's, it's a good tool to fit uh, detection tasks. Um, and for confidence, this, uh, this novel fitting procedure assumes the existence of post-decisional uh, accumulation, which is a, a natural way to uh, mimic uh, the metacognitive noise that has been described in, in many studies uh, before ours. And um, it has also, it provides two simple def definitions of detection and confidence. It, it defines detection as uh, the thresholded accumulated evidence in time and confidence as the max of accumulated evidence in time. Third and last uh, data set, uh, we switch gear and we uh, go to a complete different population, complete different brain structure. This time I will present you some results about patients undergoing surgery for deep brain stimulation in a uh, 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 brain structure uh, that is the subthalamic uh, nucleus. And you may wonder why the hell do we uh, study the subthalamic nucleus when we um, uh, deal with uh, uh, tactile detection and confidence. Well, in fact, uh, it's been described in many uh, interesting papers that uh, the STN might in fact regulate uh, the decision threshold through interactions with uh, the cortex. So um, there are many papers in during discrimination task or, or go no go task, conflicting task, which uh, propose that the STN serves as a modulator of this decision bound, it pushes it up. Uh, for instance, uh, when uh, there is a conflict and you need more evidence to uh, uh, make a decision, or when uh, instructions favor accuracy over speed, the role of the STN could be to uh, push this, uh, this boundary up. So we thought that uh, the STN might also be uh, involved uh, in, uh, in, in this model, but this time applied to detection and confidence uh, report. Um, and we can study this in two different ways, either uh, uh, based on coalitional evidence, where we simply measure uh, the STN um, for hits, misses, and high and low confidence. And because it's a very deep structure, uh, we need to rely on intraoperative recordings. And we can also do, do so uh, uh, through causal evidence where we either uh, 
a lesion, the, the STN, in case, for instance, of a septalamotomy, or more recently, where we, when we inhibit the STN through deep brain stimulation. So we're involved in the two uh, uh, strategies, let's say, uh, but today I will only speak about uh, the correlational evidence. Okay, so we uh, collaborate with uh, neurosurgeons from uh, West Virginia University in uh, Morgantown in the US, um, who on a very regular basis uh, implant uh, electrodes uh, in patients with uh, Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. And the, the goal here is to uh, uh, use a little pacemaker that you can see here to stimulate the SCN, inhibit it, and uh, alleviate some of the motor uh, uh, symptoms in these in these patients. Um, during the, the surgery, uh, to make sure that the neurosurgeon is in the right spot in the brain, uh, he inserts a microelectrode that is not used to stimulate, but that is used to uh, record single neuron activity. Okay, so uh, the patient is awake, and after the uh, uh, microelectrode uh, is inserted, uh, the neurosurgeon gives us uh, 20, 20 minutes uh, of research time where we can actually uh, perform the experiments I told you um, earlier about. So this is us uh, freaking out, uh, trying to run our exper experiment and hoping our code won't break while the neurosurgeon uh, waits for us. Uh, the patient just woke up from a, a general anesthesia and uh, we ask him or her to uh, detect those weak uh, vibrotactile stimuli and tell us how confident he or she is um, in, uh, in the response. Um, this is uh, preliminary data. Uh, among 11 patients, we isolated 19 neurons, uh, a quarter of them being uh, showing a, a different spike rate uh, between hits and misses. Here I show you two uh, examples. In both examples, you can see that after around 80 milliseconds uh, following stimulus onset, you have a sharp increase in, uh, in uh, spike rates, uh, but more so in misses than for uh, hits. So this is the complete different picture uh, as the one I, I presented you earlier. This time, misses evoke a stronger evoked response, which goes well with the idea that the, when the STN uh, spikes more, it pushes the decision bound up and uh, this results uh, in uh, more misses than hits. If you take the same neurons and then you split uh, the response this time uh, as a function of confidence, you see that both for hits on the left and for misses on the right, you have higher spike rate for uh, low confidence than high confidence uh, ratings. So we're still figuring out a way to uh, feed these results into our models, but our, uh, we have a hunch that uh, modulation of uh, decision bound would also result in a more low confidence rounds. So this is a, a very long lasting and a difficult experiment to uh, run. We've been on it for I think two or three years. Uh, we're still at the stage of preliminary evidence because we have a few neurons, but these results could su suggest that uh, the STN is involved also in detection and uh, confidence. And at the moment, we are also trying to uh, assess the causal role of the STN uh, with deep brain stimulation, this time collaborating with um, OCD patients. And we try to see if by stimulating the STN through DBS, we could lower this decision bound by inhibiting it and therefore uh, resulting in a more uh, liberal uh, detection and confidence ratings. I'm done with the data. I hope you, you're still with me. Um, I just have a few take home messages uh, before I finish. So regarding perceptual consciousness, uh, I like this uh, definition of detection as the thresholded accumulated evidence that we documented irrespective of our response effectors or task demands. It has a series of uh, theoretical implications maybe that maybe we could uh, discuss. First of all, it considers uh, conscious access as a uh, all or none uh, phenomenon, which uh, has been proposed uh, many times, but uh, I think this is a nice empirical uh, validation of this proposal. And of course, it would be important to verify that this also occurs for uh, much simpler, maybe uh, more complex stimuli. Uh, it's maybe not so surprising that a simple vibration is, is perceived as all or none 
Uh, so it'd be interesting to see if more like multi-feature stimuli also evolve uh, all on an axis. Uh, it could support a uh, prediction made by the global neuronal workspace theory uh, saying that crossing the decision bound may trigger ignition. So now we're, we'd like to perform experiments with a, a, a different uh, recording sites where we could see what happens after the decision bound is crossed uh, uh, as uh, instantiated by the posterior parietal cortex. It'd be nice, for instance, to see what occurs in, uh, in prefrontal regions. But of course, there is a necessity versus uh, sufficiency uh, issue here. By no means, uh, I want to claim that uh, evidence accumulation is both necessary and sufficient for uh, consciousness. We know that it occurs in many cognitive functions. It also occurs in organisms such as sea elegans or zebrafish, uh, for which we're not sure that their uh, conscious access is uh, similar to ours. And it also occurs, in fact, in uh, unconscious humans. So it will be important in the future to test if uh, how specific this uh, evidence accumulation is to consciousness. And the last series of uh, take home messages for uh, regarding this time perceptual monitoring. So we define confidence as the max of uh, accumulated evidence in time, which uh, can nicely account for uh, how we monitor uh, the absence of a percept, for instance, in case of this is incorrect rejections. And uh, we think that this leaky uh, accumulator model uh, we propose with the existence of a, an accumulation that persists even after the decision is made can account for some uh, uh, interesting uh, features of uh, confidence and, and metacognition. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank you all for uh, listening to me. I'd like to thank those uh, amazing patients we uh, worked with. I think uh, they should be commended for taking those pretty boring experiments at, at times, at difficult times in their life, either during a brain surgery or just after a brain surgery. And a special thanks to uh, Michael Pereira for his amazing uh, support and uh, all my other colleagues. And finally, if uh, any of this uh, made sense to you, uh, there will be uh, open positions, postdoc and PhD students uh, available soon in my, in my lab. So feel free to, to contact me through my website. Thank you very much.